what I want to talk about today is cardiac drugs. And one of the first things I want to do is give you some context of who I'm teaching so that you don't misrepresent this information and try to apply it medically. This is not medically based information. I mean, it certainly is going to give you some idea of cardiac drugs, but who I am teaching are pre-nursing students, pre-health information technology students, pre-rad tech, pre-respiratory therapy, things like that. And so this is not intended to be med school type knowledge, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I teach at community college, I teach, teach at Kirkwood Community College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And what I'm trying to do here is teach my students cardiac physiology through an understanding of how we give drugs or pharmaceuticals to influence that physiology. Now I've got a background in neuroscience, which means I have a background in electrophysiology. So to the best of my knowledge, and I don't think it's necessarily a horribly uninformed knowledge, everything is, is correct based on my research. But again, I wouldn't use it as medical-based knowledge. When I look at cardiac drugs, I can break them down into three main types of drugs. I break them down into drugs that affect afterload, and we'll come back to that. Drugs that affect what's called chronotropy. And just like chronograph is a watch, chronotropy means it's going to affect speed or time. The other thing is ionotropy. And ionotropy means you're going to affect how ions enter the muscle cells of the heart and affect how hard it contracts. So let's go through that and say, what exactly are we talking about? Afterload, what we're talking about is resistance the heart pumps against. How much is the blood pushing back? that the heart is trying to push out. And this obviously has relevance because if we can thin that or decrease afterload, that's going to, first thing it's going to do is it's going to increase com something called stroke volume. And I'm just going to shorten this as SV. And if you don't understand stroke volume, I'll be putting up another video later that describes cardiac output. So CO is cardiac output. The gist of it is stroke volume is how many milliliters of blood that can be pumped per cycle. And if you can increase that, then you can increase how much blood is pumped, which is cardiac output. And essentially, cardiac output is a combination of the product, specifically, of how much blood you can pump per cycle versus how many cycles. So cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Chronotropy is essentially heart rate. We're going to affect the cells in the atrium of the heart that set the pace. And ionotropic drugs will affect contractility. If we come back over here to afterload, there's really four different ways that we can decrease afterload. Again, decrease the resistance that the heart has to pump against. One of the things that might be a problem that's stressing the heart is we've got thick blood. And this is going to come up again, but what I mean by thick blood here is I mean platelets are aggregating. So you can give drugs that decrease platelet aggregation. They don't like to stick together. And this is the basis for giving things like aspirin. You can also decrease what's called coagulation, or I'm going to shorten it to just clotting. So if you've had some knowledge on blood, you know that there's two different steps. There's multiple steps, but the two basic steps are platelet. Basically, platelets plug the hole, and then they get tied down, is the way I describe it. They tie, get tied down in clotting. So two of those things, if blood is clotting, or if platelets are aggregating inside of the blood vessel, then that's going to be harder for the heart to push that sticky blood. Another thing that can happen that can increase afterload is what if there's too much fluid? If you think about drinking a, a liter of water, all of a sudden you've gone from five liters of blood to six liters of blood. That's harder on the heart to pump, so that's too much fluid. What you can do then is give somebody a diuretic, and a diuretic makes you go to the bathroom specifically makes you urinate. And there are multiples, if you've got some background on this, there's loop diuretics, there's thiazomide diuretics, um, there's a bunch of different diuretics, there's potassium sparing diuretics, but we're just going to basically focus on the real simple ones, which are to reduce sodium reuptake in kidneys.
if you don't take up sodium, then you don't take up water, and there's less food. I think about it in terms of if you eat a bunch of popcorn, then sodium, you're eating a bunch of sodium, and water follows it. So what I'm trying to say is sodium and water tend to stick together. So if you can reduce sodium uptake in the kidneys, then you're also reducing water uptake, which means you're going to get rid of fluid. Another thing you can do is what if vessels are too constricted? Vessels can dilate and vessels can constrict. And one of the ways to decrease afterload is to make your blood vessels larger, and that's going to decrease the resistance of blood flowing through it. So if we can dilate vessels, then we can reduce this constriction and make it easier for blood to flow through these vessels. It's just like uh, if you want to move a lot of water, you'd like a nice big wide open hose, a big diameter hose versus a small one. Same thing here is if we'd like to move a lot of blood, make it easier for the heart to increase cardiac output, then we could dilate the vessels. And the classic one to do this is inhibit something called ACE. And we will talk about ACE when we get to the urinary system because ACE is in a cascade where renin is released by the kidneys. It leads to ACE, which is put out by the capillaries and allows blood vessels to constrict, and it also causes sodium to be reabsorbed. So ACE is also going to inhibit this. What's going to happen is this is going to cause blood vessels to dilate. So ACE inhibitors, normally ACE is put out by capillaries and they give renin kind of permission to constrict blood vessels because renin likes to increase blood, blood pressure. Well if we inhibit ACE, we inhibit renin and then renin cannot lead to a state where we dilate blood vessels, and renin also causes sodium uptake, so it's kind of a complex mo molecule. So if we inhibit both of those, we end up inhibiting sodium reabsorption, and we cause blood vessels to dilate. Another way that we can affect blood pressure is if there's too much lipid in vessels or blood. If there's too much lipid in the blood vessel, then that means oh, you're going to narrow the blood vessel. It wouldn't be nice to get rid of that extra lipid. Or if you've got too much lipid in the blood, it makes it really thick and viscous. So it would be nice to get rid of that. So what you can do is give anti-hyperlipidemics. These reduce lipids in the blood. An example are snacks. Okay, so that finishes up drugs that affect afterload, and we'll come back to afterload in another video, but just wanted to reiterate one more time that basically these drugs make it easier for the heart to pump blood by making the blood either thinner or by opening up blood vessels so that the blood can move blood through nice big wide open hoses versus narrow uh, constricting hoses. We're going to move over here to chronotropy now, and I'm trying to get everything on one page, and I realize that I'm writing really small for the camera, but I want to get everything on one page. That's my motto. Chronotropic drugs alter ion channels to either let more ions flow, more or less ions flow. If you have no idea what I'm talking about with ion channels, there's going to be another video that's on cardiac action potential. And I'll link to that video. That link should be popping up right about now. And there it is. When we're talking about action potentials, just really briefly, there's a certain set of cells. This is my heart. Kind of. There's a set of cells up here that are called the pacemaker. They're high up in the right atrium. And if you don't understand action potentials, again, watch that other video. But what I'm going to draw here is an action potential. And this is the action potential when an action potential is voltage changing over time. This is how voltage change over time in those particular cells. And there's three ion channels that are important here. This is a, a sodium leak channel. What's right there? Sodium. This is calcium. And this is the gist of what I'm going to say is if you can inhibit any of these, then it's going to cause the flow to be lesser. 
and if each of these peaks is a heart rate, is a heartbeat, then by slowing these rates, then you're going to slow down heart rate. You can also give drugs. Here I'd say if I'm increasing the sodium rate, here I'd be increasing the calcium rate. I'm making a steeper line. Or here if I'm increasing the potassium. Now you can see that I'm going to go through the cycle much faster, and that would increase heart rate. Pink again is going to be decrease heart rate. Now you wouldn't get a drug to affect each of these all at the same time. You'd want separate drugs to influence the sodium channels or the calcium channels or the potassium channels. So I'm going to draw these out separately. I'm going to draw three of these. I'm just going to draw a short portion. And I'm going to make this one sodium. This one's called a fast calcium channel, and this one's just called a potassium channel. And technically speaking, there are multiple potassium channels working here together, but we're just going to group them as one. Say you could speed up or open up this sodium channel, then this rate will go up faster. <clears throat> this rate I'm trying to draw is staying the same. I'm trying to draw this parallel, and this rate will stay the same. I'm trying to draw these two as parallel. The one rate that is changing is the sodium entry. But you'll see that this is going to increase heart rate. And this is essentially what happens when you eat a bunch of salty food. Or I always remember if I ate uh, sunflower seeds while playing baseball, that extra salt would increase my heart rate more than if I didn't eat sunflower seeds. And it's because that sodium can enter the cell faster, speeds up the rate, and your heart can cycle through this uh, action potential faster. You can also give drugs that slow the entry of sodium. So I'm slowing this rate right here. I'm going to keep all the other slopes the same. But you can see that this is going to decrease heart rate. So you can increase and decrease heart rate. So you can increase and decrease heart rate by increasing or decreasing the ability of sodium to enter the cell. Same thing with calcium. If you give calcium channel, something that stimulates the calcium channel. So before we were talking about this, this sodium, but now we're going to talk about this calcium. So calcium occurs right in this slope. And so we can speed up this rate by giving a drug that increases the ability of calcium to go in the cell. And this also would increase heart rate. Don't really do that much, but there are calcium channel blockers it would slow this rate. This rate will stay the same. This rate would stay the same. And this rate would slow it. And that would decrease heart rate. You can do the same thing with potassium. You can give drugs that make potassium. So potassium is over here. That make potassium leave faster. Potassium leaves the cell. So this rate will stay the same. And all other rates will stay the same. This rate will speed up, and that will increase heart rate. <clears throat> you can also give drugs, or the body uses drugs, to affect this rate, too, that would slow down this pain. When I say that the body does this, actually, adrenaline does this. Adrenaline will actually increase the permeability of these potassium channels, increase the ability of potassium to leave the cell, and that'll speed up heart rate. A drug you may have heard, might have heard of is a beta blocker, and a beta blocker inhibits the ability of the sympathetic nervous system to stimulate potassium channels. So by extension, what it's doing is inhibiting potassium channels. And again, if you inhibit potassium channels, then you slow this rate, and that would slow heart rate. I'm going to come over here next and talk about ionotropic drugs. And ionotropic drugs alter ion, I'm going to call it permeabilities this time. It says permeabilities in heart muscle. 
and here our overall action. So over here I drew you an overall action potential, and I'm going to do that here real briefly. This is what a muscle action potential looks like. So again, we're changing voltage over time. This is a sodium channel, very fast and large sodium channel. And maybe I'll just draw this out. This is sodium. For time, calcium opens right here, and I'm just going to trace. I'm not going to draw the actual voltage changes. I'm just going to draw where they have influence on the voltages. So this would be calcium, and calcium channels open for a little bit of time, and potassium channels open up, and they stay open for longer than calcium channels. And what's actually happening here, if we were to look at the cell during this plateau, is the reason the voltage is not changing is because potassium is leaving as calcium is entering. And this calcium is going to cause calcium causes muscle contraction. Kind of a saying I always say is calcium is an on switch in the body. Calcium is the first thing that happens when sperm meets egg. Calcium causes muscle contraction. Calcium causes neurons to talk to other neurons. And in this case, calcium is causing muscle contraction. So this calcium is entering the cell, and it's causing the heart muscle to contract. So we can affect heart contractility by affecting calcium channels. We can either inhibit this calcium channel or stimulate this calcium channel. Now, one of the things that calcium needs in order to enter is it needs to be offset by potassium leaving. It's a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like having your drain open in your bathtub while you're trying to fill it up. And what's going to happen is you're going to keep water at a plateau level. And we're not talking about water here, obviously we're talking about voltage, but there's a large plateau here in our voltage and our action potential. And that plateau comes because calcium is coming in and is being balanced by potassium exiting. So it's pretty easy to see that calcium is going to affect muscle contraction, and by altering this calcium entry, we're affecting muscle contraction. But since it's tied to potassium, any kind of alteration in potassium will also affect calcium, will also affect muscle contraction. So now we have to draw out three of these to point out how changes in calcium will affect muscle contraction, how changes in sodium will affect muscle contraction. And you might be thinking, what the heck is that third one there for? And that one's for a very common class of drugs called the Johnson, and they affect something that we didn't really talk about, but hopefully you've heard it before, which is the sodium-potassium pump. And I'll come back to that. We'll do cal potassium here, and we'll do calcium here. Now again, I'm not really drawing specifically the voltage changes that are, are going to occur. I'm just tracing in the plateau how it would change the plateau. The reason I'm doing it is because technically to, to draw the voltage changes is creates kind of a, let's just say, a unique kind of trace, and I don't necessarily want to uh, confuse you with that. So, for example, potassium channels would open and then close, and the trace would kind of look kind of like that. But you kind of have to know your electrophysiology to understand what the heck um, voltage is changing like that over time. So I'm just going to say, if we can inhibit calcium, then this is going to make this plateau lower that's going to decrease contractility one of these days I'll get better at the making room or if we can increase this calcium channel we can actually increase contractility and maybe I'll just go ahead and, and draw what's going on in the cell if this is a cell If we increase calcium, it's going to increase contractility. If we inhibit these channels and so less calcium come in, comes in, that's going to decrease contractility. Now let's get back to potassium. And remember, potassium was tied to calcium. So any kind of effect on potassium will affect calcium. So if you increase the ability of potassium to leave the cell, and that's like making this larger. Let's just go ahead and draw that. 
if you increase potassium's ability to leave, then you should have done it this way. If you increase potassium's ability to leave, <coughs> then you increase calcium's ability to enter. If you decrease the potassium, make sure plateau is smaller. Smaller voltage voltage changes, less potassium entering. And so if you make a small potassium, you make small calcium. And we talked before about how adrenaline affects potassium. Adrenaline affects potassium in the same way in heart muscle as it did in the pacemaker cell. Adrenaline stimulates potassium channels. If you stimulate the potassium channel, you get more calcium coming in, you're going to get a stronger contra contraction. So adrenaline not only speeds up the heart rate, but it also causes the heart to beat more strongly. Also, if you get beta blockers, we talked about beta blockers back here, inhibiting that effect on potassium, then what's going to happen here is you're going to decrease the potassium. That's going to decrease the calcium. And so beta blockers slow down the heart rate, and they also decrease contractility. Now it's kind of a tricky thing. That's kind of a tricky thing to describe what's going on with the Jackson, and it, truthfully, it's not really well understood by anyone at this stage. But the thought is that maybe normally a cell, these cells will sit at something like minus minus 60 millivolts. And what happens is you've got a lot of sodium on the outside, a lot of potassium on the inside, and these want to move back and forth. The theory with the the Jackson is is you poison the sodium potassium pump so you don't get quite as much sodium on the outside. Some of it can leak back in. You don't get quite as much potassium on the inside. Some of it can leak out. So the driving force, how far they're separated or how much the chemical imbalance is, is lessened so that ions want to move less. So it's going to lower the overall plateau and decrease contractility. All right, so just a real, real quick wrap-up. Basically, cardiac drugs work in one of three ways. Now, there are exceptions, but this is just introductory knowledge at this point. They will decrease afterload, make blood thinner, make it easier for the heart to pump blood. It can then pump more blood, which is going to increase cardiac output, pump more blood per cycle, which is going to increase cardiac output. You can give pharmaceuticals or give drugs that affect heart rate, and they can do that through acting on three channels, sodium channels, fast calcium channels, or potassium channels. You can also give pharmaceuticals that affect contractility, and basically the way you affect contractility is you recognize that calcium causes muscle contraction. So either you increase or decrease this calcium, or since this calcium is balanced by potassium, altering this potassium channel or potassium permeability will also alter the calcium. So you can also stimulate potassium, which stimulates calcium, which stimulates contractility. You can inhibit potassium, inhibit calcium, which inhibits contractility. Another kind of a sidebar or common drug, so we need to talk about this, the Jackson. Basically, this movement of potassium and movement of calcium is dependent on the voltage potential inside the cell. The inside of the cell is negative, which drives calcium in. Calcium, which is positive, want to enter, wants to enter the negative cell. What the Jackson does is it affects and reduces that voltage potential. So calcium is less likely to enter. Potassium is less likely to leave.